Well, good morning, Seven Lakes Baptist Church, and happy Easter. We want to welcome you to our Easter service this morning. Uh, we wish that we could be together in church. I wish that we could have the Granny's Donuts. I think my mouth is watering just from thinking about those. I really wish that I could see all the children in their sweet little outfits, uh, and I wish that we could be together. But unfortunately, that's not the case right now, and we are going to do the best that we can uh, by coming together, and hopefully this video will provide you some sense of normalcy, uh, and we might even have some special children in here as uh, as you watch this video. So I want you to, at this point, go ahead and pause the video, go ahead and pray with your family, and then come back and we'll jump right in. This first song we're going to sing is a hymn that I try to have our church sing every year around Easter. It's usually at our Good Friday service. Um, but I want to encourage you not just to sing the words, but to really think on and meditate on their meaning. Sounds aloud from Calvary. See it rends the rocks asunder, shakes the earth and veils the sky. It is finished, it is finished. Hear the dying Savior cry. It is finished, it is finished. Hear the dying Savior cry. It is finished, oh what pledge What do these charming words afford Heavenly blessings without measure Flow to us from Christ the Lord It is finished, it is finished Since the dying words record It is finished, it is finished Since the dying words record shadows of the ceremonial law finished all that God had promised death and hell no more shall long it is finished it is finished saint from hence your comfort draw it is finished it is finished saint from hence your comfort draw Praise Emmanuel's name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to the bleeding Lamb. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to the bleeding Lamb. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to the bleeding Lamb. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Yes. 
desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night and through the darkness your loving kindness towards you the shadows of my soul. Your work is finished. The end is written. In Jesus Christ, my living Could imagine so great a Such boundless grace, the God of ages, stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven, the King of kings calls me. I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain, there's salvation. In your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise, your buried body. To breathe out of the silence, the roar of lion declared the grave is no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the There was a violent earthquake. For an angel of the Lord 
came down from heaven going and going to this tomb rolled back the stone and sat on it His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards, the guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know you're looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has been raised from the dead. In fact, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Listen, I have told you. Come on, let's go! So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said greetings, and they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Do you tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain, where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Glory forth. And teach all nations, baptizing them, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. It means that he was resurrected from the grave and took our sins with him. He took my sins and everybody else's sins. The meaning of Jesus raising from the dead is that uh, Jesus is God. Jesus is all-powerful um, because he rose from the dead. Uh, it also um, shows that scripture's true because um, through him being... Um, raised to life again, uh, that fulfilled many prophecies from um, the past. What it means to me is that Jesus really was the Son of God, and that's a reason to keep going every day when life gets hard. We're going to jump right in here as we talk about the validation of the resurrection. Now what we're going to talk about is the I Am statements and why they were validated by the resurrection. The first I am statement that we come to is found in John chapter 6 and verse 35 where Jesus says that I am the bread of life. Now he's saying this right after he has fed the 5,000 people with the loaves and the fish and it was 5,000 men plus the women and children and now they have all been satisfied with this food and Jesus continues to teach and he says I am the bread of life and what he's saying is that uh, whoever partakes in Jesus will never know spiritual hunger again. Um, there are so many people that are searching for satisfaction and, and searching for spiritual satisfaction and so many different things, but they always leave hungry. But when you come to Jesus, you will be completely satisfied because Jesus Christ is the bread of life. The second I am statement that we come to is Jesus says in John chapter 8 and verse 22 that I am the light of the world. Uh, this is during the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles. At that time, all the, the people, all the children of Israel would come back to Jerusalem. And they would come up to Jerusalem and the, and the temple, if, you, if you've ever been there, is up high on the hill. It's one of the highest locations in the city. And it would be lit up like a Christmas tree. And so everyone would come and they'd be able to look up and see the temple all lit up. That particular morning, Jesus got up early and he goes to the temple while it's still dark. And people came there to hear Jesus teach. And as he's teaching, 
the Pharisees bust in and they bring this woman who's caught in adultery and they throw her down at Jesus' feet. And we know the story. And they were accusing her and they were going to stone her. And, uh, and Jesus kneels down and he begins to write in the sand. And I believe he was writing the sins of these men. And he asked them, whoever's without sin, you cast the first stone. And each, uh, each Pharisee dropped their stone and left. And there was no one left to condemn the woman. And Jesus asked her, who's left to condemn you? And she said, no one. And he said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. What Jesus was revealing in that point is that he is the light of the world, that he is God, that he's omniscient, that he knows everything. Jesus knew all the sins of the Pharisees, and he knew the sin of this woman, and yet he was the one who could forgive sins. What a great thing to know that Jesus Christ is God. The third I am statement that we come to is found in John chapter 10, verses 7 and 9. And Jesus says that I am the door. Now this is the reference to the sheep gate. The shepherd would bring his sheep to the city and the she they would have to enter through the sheep gate and all the herds would go into the same pen. So the sheep were reluctant to go into the, into the city and so the shepherd would literally crawl through the sheep gate and then he would call the sheep and they would come in because they heard the shepherd's voice and they knew the shepherd's voice. There's a second kind of sheep gate that we read about and that is when the shepherd would take his flock out into the wilderness, he would build with stone a corral just a circle where all the sheep would come in and the shepherd would literally lay down and become the sheep gate and he would protect the sheep that were in there. I think when the Bible talks about this, uh, it is a reference that salvation is only found through Jesus Christ. Uh, and uh, he is the chief shepherd and we are the sheep and he uh, will lay down his life and protect us. In fact, that leads us to the next I am statement that we find in John chapter 10, verse 11. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, uh, still in the same conversation. Um, see, no one expects a sheep to be responsible for itself. They need a shepherd. And so uh, a shepherd accepts the responsibility for the well-being of the flock. The good shepherd would lay down his life for the sheep, well, Jesus literally, the good shepherd, laid down his life for us, his sheep. Um, that is the substitutional atonement that uh, is so precious that the resurrection provided for us. The fifth I am statement that we come to is found in John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. And Jesus said this, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. I want you to think about this. When Jesus is saying this, it is at the resurrection of Lazarus. Um, Lazarus has been dead for three days. He's been in the ground for three days. And Jesus comes and Mary and Martha are crying. And, uh, and they're saying, Lord, where were you? Why didn't you come? And Jesus says, don't you know who I am? Don't you know that I am the resurrection and the life? He that believes in me, even though he were dead, yet shall he live. And Mary says, Lord, we know that down the road that we'll be resurrected again. And Jesus says, don't you understand? Don't you understand that this is who I am? I think that's why Jesus wept because of their unbelief. But when Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, the resurrection validates the fact that I will not cease to exist when this body fails me. One of the things that is the great hope that we have is that when I die, when I pass away in this life, I am going to be eternally resurrected in heaven. And uh, I hope that I don't die in this life. I hope that the rapture comes back and, and, take, and Jesus takes me home that way. Um, but, but whatever, I'm going to end up with eternal life. Uh, John 3.16 says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And I wonder, church, if we realize that the resurrection of Christ validates that, that I am guaranteed that eternal inheritance. I want to tell you what a hope that is, that I get to see my grandma again, that I get to see uh, Nita's dad again, that I get to see all of the loved ones that have gone on before me. Uh, I was thinking about Gene Hoganson the other day, and I was thinking, I can't wait to get to heaven. And just, I want to sit down with him and have him tell me the stories of heaven, because he has such a great way of telling stories. And that's going to be a great day when we get to see those loved ones again. And those things are all validated by the resurrection. 
The sixth I am statement is found in John 14, 6, where Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. This is the validation of the exclusivity of Jesus Christ. God sent his one and only son. Why would God make other ways? He made the only way. He sent Jesus Christ. Jesus is the way. He is the truth and he is the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. Um, he is the only way. He is the only truth. And he is the only avenue to everlasting life. And I want you to know, if you haven't trusted Jesus Christ exclusively for your salvation, that that salvation is made available to you today because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, there was no one else who resurrected from the dead the way that Jesus Christ did. Well, the final I am statement that we find in John is found in John uh, chapter 15, verses 1 and 5, where Jesus says, I am the true vine. Uh, this passage has so much meaning for me. Um, one, because this isn't talking about our salvation. Um, we are Once we're in the vine, we're in the vine, we are saved. But when we abide in the vine, we can have that true life. We can produce the fruit that we're intended to produce. And so I want to talk to you this morning about um, abiding in the vine. Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. He that abideth in me uh, will produce much fruit. And I don't know about you, but I want to produce fruit in my life. I want to produce spiritual fruit, that fruit of love and joy and peace and gentleness and meekness and, and temperance. Uh, all of the fruits of the Spirit, God wants me to produce those things in my life. And I can't produce those things if I'm apart from Jesus Christ. But if I abide in the vine, then I will produce much fruit. And so I want to encourage you, church, that we, even though we're not meeting together right now, we can produce that spiritual fruit that Jesus has expected us and wants us to produce. But the only way we can do that is by staying in the vine. So those are the seven I am statements of the Gospel of John. And I want to ask you just a couple of questions as you go and talk about this with your family. The first question is, um, what I am statement can you recall? Uh, maybe your kids, maybe one just stood out to them. Maybe one just stood out to you that, uh, that makes you remember uh, what Jesus did. The second thing I want to ask you is, what I am statement do you most closely relate to and why? It means he sacrificed himself for all of us. It means that he conquered death. What it means to me is hope and love. Well, as we continue our time together in the Word uh, this morning on Easter, uh, we just got done talking about how the resurrection uh, validated that Jesus was who he says he was. Um, and not only did he say those things, um, but the Old Testament talked about in, in detail uh, about what would happen uh, during the life and even the death of Christ. Um, so it gave validation to him um, for those around that had been watching him um, in, the, in, the, in the years prior to that. And that's one of the things that I think about. If I was a disciple and I had walked with Jesus for three years and had seen him um, uh, turn water into wine, um, feed the thousands on multiple occasions, um, walk on water, uh, calm the storm, heal the blind, cleanse the lepers. Um, if I'd watched him cast out demons, um, I would probably, I would like to think that I would have been pretty convinced that, hey, this, this guy is the Messiah. Um, and I would have been, I would like to think that I would have been so committed to him that I would have died right alongside of him. Um, and I think sometimes we're quick to judge the disciples, um, but we and forgetting um, our own humanity um, and our own faults and failures. Uh, but even though the disciples thought, many of them thought that that they were convinced. Peter talked about um, being willing to die uh, with Christ for Christ. Um, when it came down to it, uh, when their faith was put to the test, um, they failed, uh, just like we often do. Um, unfortunately, theirs were recorded in Scripture and uh, for the rest of um, humanity to read about over the coming thousands of years. I'm, th I'm thankful that my uh, 
faults and failures aren't all recorded um, for people to read. But we read how in uh, Matthew uh, 26 and Mark 14, uh, it's the same telling of when they were in the Garden of Gethsemane right before Jesus went into the, the trial and crucifixion. Um, Judas came and betrayed Jesus with a kiss. And Jesus had just talked about it, um, that it was going to happen. And now it happened, and the soldiers take Jesus into custody, and they move, start moving him, um, and the disciples run. They all run off. Uh, these men that were so... Um, in fact, Peter was so ready uh, to defend Christ that he cut the ear off of um, one of the soldiers that was there. And um, because he was ready for a fight, he, th he thought he was ready, but when Jesus told him that wasn't the way, and, and, the, and then things started to get real, like they all, they all took off. Peter followed at a distance, uh, talks about in John 18 that, that he followed at a distance and then he was on the perimeter, the outskirts, looking into the process, but not willing to go in there and stand beside Jesus as he proclaimed that he was willing to do um, uh, previously. And that's the account of uh, where we see him deny Christ three times because he's so fearful of being associated with Jesus that he not only denounces him, but uh, my understanding is he used some pretty strong language. Um, and then through the, the crucifixion, some of his disciples were there present. They, they, they watched him uh, die, um, and then they, they saw his body come down, and the burial process took place. Um, and I can only imagine what was going through their minds um, that they had basically, they'd been all in on Jesus. They'd, they'd committed, they'd given up everything, um, or, the, or so they thought. And here, this Messiah that they were um, fully um, fully invested in, fully following, um, fully believing that he was going to come and, and, and take over the throne uh, there in the physical world at that time, and to watch all those things um, shatter and crumble, and a lot of confusion, and, um, and the unknown, and uh, just a lot of fear. And uh, um, they weren't they weren't running around talking about how awesome it was that Jesus just died on the cross to pay for the sins of humanity, um, because they they were probably doubting whether this was even all true, um, which is again hard for me to even fathom after seeing all the miracles um, and, and experiences that they had had. Um, but they were afraid, and and they weren't. In those days uh, following the crucifixion, they weren't um, they weren't bold about their Messiah. They weren't hiding. And it talks about in John 20 um, that after after Mary had seen Jesus at the tomb on on Easter morning, what we celebrate as Easter morning, um, you know, they were all together in one room with the doors locked because they were afraid of the Jews and uh, of the Jewish leaders and. Um, so here are these men that were thought that they were convinced that Jesus was who he says he was are now in hiding, in fear for their lives. And, uh, and then something happens. Something happens that changes everything. And um, when they saw Jesus appear in that room, it transformed them. It's like I, I think about like a movie when at the like at the end of the movie when you see the little flashes the the flashbacks of things that have happened throughout the movie and it kind of all comes together and 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 gives you clarity in the moment as to as to what really happened in the story um, that's what i think sometimes when i think about that moment when when they saw him for the first time and, and they and he let him touch the nail piercing holes in his hands and the the the, the spear hole in his side and they ate with him. It was like they had a moment, maybe they had a moment like that where it was just like everything just came together and clicked. And when it clicked, it changed, it transformed everything. It transformed them, it transformed the purpose of their lives, it transformed um, the reality that they um, that they under thought they understood but were confused, but now have now but now they have complete clarity on the fact that this is the Christ, this is the Messiah, this is the Son of God, and um, the one thing that, that needed to happen to fulfill all of it just happened and they were there. And, um, and we see these men, um, after they were, Jesus met with them uh, multiple times. It talks um, throughout the Gospels of the different accounts where Jesus made himself known to them. And you know, in Matthew 28, at the end of the chapter, it talks about 
uh, that he, when he appeared to the 12 and to a, a, a bunch of other of his followers, he gave them the great commission saying, go into the world and preach the gospel. And, um, and these same men that were so fearful, uh, just previously were now, um, in the first chapters of Acts, uh, standing on a platform, proclaiming the gospel with boldness, um, under the power of the Holy Spirit, um, to the masses where thousands of people were coming uh, to Christ, um, because of their message. Um, they were transformed. They weren't the men that they had been previous um, to the resurrection. Um, they were now different and in, and and empowered um, with the Spirit to the point that um, out of the remaining eleven, because uh, Judas uh, committed suicide, out of the remaining eleven disciples, um, to include uh, Paul later on, who would become an apostle, um, which Zach's going to talk about in a minute. They all gave their lives. Ten of the eleven, of the ten of the original um, remaining eleven, gave their lives. And John probably thought he was going to give his life when they uh, put him in the big vat of oil, oil to boil him. Um, he probably went in there thinking that he was going to um, die for uh, his faith. Um, although he survived and then was exiled to um, the island where he wrote um, the Book of Revelation. Um, but they were willing, and what was it like? It's one as I as I've read and studied. It's one of the most convincing um, things for Christianity that that people the lengths at which people went to to stick to stick to to cling to their faith to not renounce their faith. Um, it, it it's it had to have been true. Um, the resurrection was the catalyst that emboldened these men to go and proclaim the gospel which grew the church um, which grew faithful followers that for years and years to come um, they they experienced atrocities that we couldn't even imagine um, talks about that they were um, made to wear the the skins of animals and then they'd be attacked by dogs in the Colosseum that they were fed to the lions um, that they were used for human torches they were covered in oil and they were put up on these poles and burn alive um, so that uh, the near uh, Nero um, could uh, light the gardens for his parties um, and they did that because that happened to them because they were unwilling to renounce their faith because they were so convinced now not all of those people saw um, the risen Christ but it be, but because those those disciples and those followers saw the risen Christ it transformed them and it changed everything for the future to come um, and we should be thankful for the men and women that, that stuck to their faith um, with such ferocity because with the church that we have today here in Seven Lakes is because of um, those original um, people that were willing um, to be so convinced about what they know to be true. So uh, we see that the resurrection not only uh, validated that Jesus was who he says he was, um, and he didn't stop there. Um, that same ex that same event then went on to transform the early followers and disciples of Christ to go and to give their lives um, to his purposes and to spreading the gospel um, around the world. Uh, so now is uh, in the next moment or two, I'm going to have you to go ahead and, and pause the video and we'll get into some uh, time of discussion. You can go ahead and pause the video now. I think what it what it means to me um, is that if God is powerful enough to not only have it in him to send his son to earth to die for us and to uh, be raised to life, if he's powerful enough to do all of that, then he is powerful enough and more than capable to to help me handle any situation that, that I find myself in. Um, any problem that I think is too big for me to handle or too big for God to handle, um, putting that in perspective of, of what he did on the cross and what he did in terms of literally raising a man from the dead, um, it makes, um, it just puts his, his power into perspective. He is so mighty to save us and he is mighty to, to help us through whatever, whatever difficult situation that we, we find ourselves in in our life. It means that he conquered death and came back to life. Jesus dying on the cross means to me that when Jesus died, he gave his life for everyone to have, and it's 
like a present in front of you and if you don't open it then you won't have it. It means that he loves us and he wants us to spend the rest of our lives with him and be in heaven with him and live for eternity. What it means is kind of what Andrew said. It means that he has a place for us. He doesn't want us to go anywhere else. He wants us to go with him and live our lives with him for the rest of our lives. And that's what it means. We've heard from Pastor Chris about how the resurrection validates Christ's claims. How it means that he was who he said he was. And it also means he could do what he said he could do, which includes the forgiveness of sins. You also have Pastor Josh who talked about how the resurrection is transformational. As we were talking about the message this week and what we wanted to kind of address in regards to the resurrection, one of the things that kind of bubbled to the surface in my heart was the reality that the resurrection is one of the most significant things that has ever happened, historically, but also in your life and in my life. I was kind of thinking and meditating on that, and I, I came across this really interesting place in scripture and it's in Mark 16 and I want to encourage you to turn there in your Bible if you can because I want you to see it it's in every Bible uh, and it's it's kind of interesting I'm gonna start reading from verse 5 in Mark 16 and kind of to catch us up with where the story is Christ has been crucified at this point um, the believers are some scattered some in hiding um, some gathered together in hiding but they're scared they're not sure what to do and they're dealing with the loss of their leader. And it feels like all the promises of God at this point are probably crashing down on them. And they feel like their world has been shattered. And so you have three women, uh, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and, and Salome. And they're going to the tomb to minister uh, to Christ's body. So we pick it up in verse 5. They say they entered the tomb. They saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side. They were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he told them. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they put him? But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there, just as he told you. And note verse 8. It says, They went out and ran from the tomb, because trembling and astonishment overwhelmed them. And they said nothing to anyone, since they were afraid. And what's really interesting to me is, after this, in the Gospel of Mark, uh, all of your Bibles have some way of noting that the last 12 verses, verses 9 to 20, they're not in the earliest manuscripts. So, so what does that mean? Well, that means that the oldest manuscripts that we have are cut off after verse 8. In fact, some scholars studying Mark think that verse 8 actually is incomplete. This last sentence, and they said nothing to anyone since they were afraid it's not really the end of a sentence. It's almost like Mark started a thought and never finished it. Um, I, I read one, one guy who thought that possibly the original scroll was ripped or torn or broken or something, and we lost the last section, last little chapter here uh, of Mark. And so what we have here in the last 12 verses from 9 to 20 are where later copyists and uh, scholars have tried to put in uh, what, the way they thought. Mark would finish it. But that leaves us at verse 8, kind of the, the true ending of Mark, and it leaves us hanging. It's kind of like unfinished business. Looking at this section, the three things popped out at me. Number one, the women had a very normal reaction. These were women that had ministered to and been with Christ uh, throughout a lot of his ministry. Uh, but when they were confronted with this situation and they were already wrestling with a bunch of emotions, they didn't quite know how to react. And I feel like I might have reacted like them. Uh, it says they were because trembling and astonishment overwhelmed them. They, they ran away and they didn't say anything because they were afraid. It's a very human reaction. Also kind of interesting to note that at this point, things have changed. So number two, like number one, they had a very human reaction. Number two, things had changed. Before, if you go back in Mark, uh, Jesus actually instructed his disciples multiple times not to tell, not to speak. But here, the command is go and tell. Things change in life. Sometimes what God has told you 
at one time, God tells you to do something different later because things have changed. Thirdly, and this is the one that kind of convicts me, is they were confronted with the reality of the resurrection and their reaction was not the best. They were there. They were there the day that Christ arose and they didn't respond perfectly. Just because something spiritually significant happens doesn't mean that you and I are going to respond perfectly. It's kind of convicting. Um, also kind of humbling. I know that I need to humble myself and submit myself to God no matter what. But I think too in this passage, we can see exactly what we've been talking about this morning. Because we see that when they saw that young man in the tomb, they were confronted with a validation of Christ's claims. That young man that said, he is risen. Well, you know what? Christ said he would rise from the dead. Which means that Christ was probably not wrong about anything else he said. And you know one of the other things that Christ said is that he could forgive sins. Like, that's crazy. So there was a validation of Christ's ministry here in the resurrection, but there's also this transformation. I think that's what overwhelmed them. That's what awed them. The original Greek, the words for the astonishment and amazement and fear, they're, they're two ends of the spectrum. They're joyful, amazement. Uh, what has happened is incredible. But then there's also fear. This is insane. Things are crazy. They don't know what to do. They're at both ends of the spectrum at both times. And so what do they do? They run away and they don't say a word. But if you back up just a few verses, and it's in verse 7, you'll see, But go, tell his disciples and Peter. And so with the resurrection, we get this command to go and tell. And you see this later on the Mount of Ascension and everything else where with the Great Commission, Christ says, go and make disciples of all men. There's an orientation that happens in our lives in the resurrection. It calls us to do something, calls us to be something. You know, what's really interesting is if you turn to Acts chapter 9, and we look at the story of Paul. Actually, it's the story of Saul who would become Paul. We see something very similar happen in his life. In chapter 9, Starting in verse 3, it says, As he, which is Saul, traveled and was nearing Damascus, a light from heaven suddenly flashed around him. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting, he replied. But get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. <laughs> I love this moment because in this moment, we can see how Saul is confronted with with the reality of Christ, okay? Saul was an expert of the Old Testament law, and part of that was the reason he was persecuting the church. He did not believe that Christ was who he claimed to be. Yet in this moment, Christ himself came, proved his resurrection to Saul, and it transformed Saul's world. So Christ's claims were validated for Saul. Uh, it transformed Saul's life. And then you can also see, even in that moment, Saul's life is given a new orientation. He's told, Go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. And from there, you can go into the book of Acts and see what Saul does and how it orients his whole life into proclaiming the gospel of Christ and discipling nations, essentially. I think the same orientation that happened to the ladies there at the tomb, because even though the gospel of Mark ends at verse 8 and we're left kind of hanging, we know that they eventually did go on and speak of what they saw. We know that Paul went on and taught and wrote. He wrote most of the New Testament. I think that same orientation calls out to you and I. And the kind of truncated ending to Mark actually beckons to us. The story is not finished. We're part of it. So the question is, how has our life been oriented by the resurrection? Has yours? If so, how? We're going to pause the video and I want us to just talk about this. So as we wrap up the video today, I thank you for joining us. I hope that you were able to go through these questions with your family and have great discussion about who Jesus was. In fact, we've talked at the beginning how 
um, the resurrection validated all of the all of the statements that Jesus said who he was that he is the Son of God that he is I am he is the one who knows everything uh, he is the resurrection and the life and without him you cannot come to God uh, in fact it said that he is the way the truth and the life and no one comes to God except through him and so uh, I pray that if you haven't ever trusted Jesus Christ to be your way to God to be your Lord and Savior um, I pray that today will be the day that you will make that decision in your life. Um, the, the truth of it is that it, it is just as true today as it was more than 2,000 years ago when he resurrected. And it will be true forever because Jesus is God. The second thing we talked about, Josh talked to us about the uh, transformation that the resurrection had on people. Uh, it transformed the disciples who were cowards into these men who were willing to give their life because of uh, because of what Jesus did. They believed with everything that they had that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, that He is the Son of God, that He resurrected from the grave. More than 500 people saw Him a after He had been resurrected. And there's all kinds of people that try to uh, try to uh, talk that away, but the truth of the matter is there were. Um, many people that saw more than a thousand people after the resurrection that saw him 500 at one time and uh, I don't think all 500 of those had had an illusion or, or anything like that um, but that transformation that changed the disciples is the same thing that happened to me when I re when I realized that Jesus Christ is God that he um, that he died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin that he resurrected from the grave it transformed my life. I'm not the same person that I was before because of the resurrection power and how it has changed and transformed my life. And then Zach talked about how it reorients our life. And uh, I know for me, it has reoriented my life in so many ways. We, we talked about the Apostle Paul and how it had reoriented his life. Um, and that's what the gospel does. The, the resurrection, it reorients us. It gives us new purpose and new meaning in life. And I pray that this Easter, that you reflect on how it has transformed and changed your life, how it's reoriented your life, and the validation that it has given that Jesus Christ is who he said he was. I pray that you have a wonderful Easter with your family. Uh, as we end this video, I, I hope that you'll stop and pray with your family and encourage each other and worship uh, our Savior, Jesus Christ, for what he's done by the resurrection. God bless you, and have a great Easter.